okay, I wonder where it was, is that you had to live with other people who had this sickness because you were contagious and your family, you couldn't live with your family. So if you got this sickness, you had to go away. So you were away from your family. One day, Jesus was in a small town and there were 10 of these people and they said, Jesus, heal us, heal us. And what do you think Jesus did? Yep, you got it. He healed them. He healed them. And they were so excited. And he said, go to, go to your priest. Show your priest that you've been healed. And he, they were so excited. Can you imagine how that would be? I'll bet they danced and they sang and they were laughing. And one of the first things they did is that they ran home to their family. Now, there were 10 of them. And one said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to go back and thank Jesus. So he ran back to Jesus. He fell down and he said, Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. So this week I've been thinking about it, and I said, well, that's horrible. That is horrible that only, how many were there? How many? Ten. And how many thanked Jesus? One. I thought, that's horrible that only one would thank Jesus. And then I thought, you know what, Bev? How many times do you not thank Jesus for everything? Do you always thank Jesus? You do? Okay, then, then this will be good. Because in the scriptures, it talks about cups overflowing with thanks and praise. And in Jewish times, when you would go into somebody's house, sometimes they would intentionally give you a cup and fill it so that it would overflow. Do not try this at home. And it would overflow, and that meant we are so glad that you are here. We're so thankful and grateful that you are here, that we're going to overflow your cup. Because they understood that. They understood that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to see what happens here. If we can think of things we're thankful for and make our cup overflow. All right? So I'll start. I am thankful for Jesus' grace and God's grace in my life. Here it goes. All right. Can everybody think of one thing they're thankful for? We're going to start with one thing. Go ahead. Family. Family. All right. Okay. Friends. Friends. Yep. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Is that all we're thankful for? No. Pets. Ooh, pets, yeah. You've got a nice one, too, don't you? What else? Yeah. All right. Grandmas. Oh, yes, grandmas. Yes. Okay, now. God's love. Okay, how about some more? Those of you that haven't said you're thankful for something. Yeah. Shelter, yeah. And it's getting cold. You want that. Okay. Hang on. Keep that thought, okay? Let's see. Got some others? Yeah. Matt, did you do it already? Okay. For the church. All right. Do we have some others? Do you have one, Macy? None? Okay. Got any? 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 Okay. Go ahead. We can do two now. Food. Water. Food. Water. Oop, what's happened? Overload. Yeah. Free. Um, plain. plain. Ooh. Who likes plain? I like plain. Oh, oh boy, we got tons. Noah. You have one, Noah? Did you have another one? Oh, okay. Oh, well, all right. Yeah. Sisters, whoa, that's good. Brothers, all right. Sister, oh, sister, okay, sister, that's right. And grandpas, yeah, I wondered where we were going to get grandpas in there. Babies, you like babies, yeah. Any other? Any others? Yeah. God's healing. What else? Everything. Everything, whoa, that takes like five of those, right? <laughs> Four or five. Okay, so what have we done here? Our cup has overflowed with thanks, right, for God's blessings. All right, we have a lot more water here, and we could fill this up because I can see your brains are really turning. But um, we're going to stop now and say a prayer. All right? Okay. Lord, you give us everything we need, and we don't always thank you. 
please help us remember to thank you and to keep our cup overflowing with thanks, praise for everything that you do for us. Amen. Expectations. Been talking for a couple of days now about expectations. Last week was what was expected. We had the servants not allowed to sit at the table. It just come in from their meal. Something expected. Today, something unexpected. But the problem with Scripture is that we hear it so much. We tell the story so often. We already know the punchline to the story. Ten lepers were healed. Only one came back. And he was a Samaritan. And we hear it, and we hear it, and we hear it, and we lose track of that unexpected portion of the story. So let me lay upon you some ideas that are unexpected. This is not your book. You know that, right? Not only is it not your book, it's not a book. It's 66 books all put under one binding. We lose track of that. We forget that. Something else we forget. We forget we need to pray before we do a sermon. So let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills whence cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grant a blessing on this time spent of the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, they will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. All right, I need some pre-selected volunteers that don't know they've been pre-selected, but I'm happy to say they're all here today, so that's a good thing. Dick Selgo, come up here. And uh, Tom, come on. And uh, uh, Brian Huffman, you got to come up too. And Ken Lobb. Oh, look at that tie. You even got the tie. Come on up. There, we got, we've, got the, we've got the head coach of the Archibald Blue Streaks. We've got the... Fan of the evil empire. <laughs> and, and I can't believe you guys are standing together. A, a tiger and an Indian. Oh, isn't that sweet? Yeah, that ain't going to happen in about six months. All right, here you go. You get a card. Having a little pop quiz today. Have each of your fields up there represented. So you can see it, you can look at it, write down the answer to the question. What are the most important six inches of real estate on each of these baseball fields? Mm, give it some thought. Come on, coach, I'm expecting big things from you. Most important six inches of real estate on each of these baseball fields. It's exactly the same. Dun 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 Got it? Okay, here we go. All right, let's line up. Let's line up. Let's let's start let's start with the one we we worry about the most. We're Indians fan. Bring, bring your card. Okay. And your answer is? I have no idea. Pitching you, mound. The pitching mound. Of course, that's what, uh, eight feet around. Yeah, that's about what we expect from Cleveland. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can go sit back down. Okay. <sighs> Detroit. I can't believe I'm agreeing, All right. agreeing with a... Oh, yeah, we've already sent the Tigers home, too, just like in... 
<laughs> Yankees, all right, Yankees. Now, this is supposedly the greatest and best baseball team in the entire world for all time. The answer is... Inside edge of home plate. Inside edge of home plate. Close, but no cigar. Thank you very much. Okay, coach. Expecting big things from the coach. That's where I was. I oh! Home plate. Now, now, I'll give you a nice coaching tip here. I tell all the players I ever coached, the most important six inches between on, on the baseball field is... <laughs> good point. He says it's a good point. There we go. No, the Cincinnati fan won. The most important thing is the six inches between the ears of the players. You see, unlike football where you match pattern play against pattern play to see which pattern play was better drawn up by a coach three weeks ago, baseball is a game played in the moment, and the player has to know all the different possibilities of what might happen in the next second and prepare to move and react according to what unfolds. It's a thinking man's game, and they all have to be thinking all the time. It's not enough to know what might happen next. It's knowing all 15 things that might happen next, being prepared for all of them. And the thing is, in the church, it's the same. This Bible was not written for your time. It's not written in your language. It's not written to your culture. And all of those affect how we understand and know what the story is trying to tell us. And if we don't think about these things and study them and try to understand them, then we can never truly understand what Scripture is telling us today. Because through our faith and through the power of the Spirit of God, it is still relevant to us today even though it's not written for our time or in our language or for our culture. So the thing we always miss with certain stories is why is it the Sumerians that we're always talking about? Kingdom of David... One single unified kingdom, Jerusalem, set up its, as its capital eventually. And that's the place where the palace was built. David determined in looking at his grand palace that maybe it wasn't such a good thing that God's home was simply a tent pitched up outside of town. And so he started talking about building a temple a grand temple that would be located next to the king's palace and be better and bigger than the king's palace because it needed to be suitable for God. But he wasn't allowed to build that. Instead, it fell upon his son Solomon to build the temple, the first temple. After Solomon's reign... The kingdom broke up, became two kingdoms. Israel became the name of the northern kingdom, and Judea, the southern. The capital of the southern kingdom was Jerusalem. The capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. Judea, Jews. Samaria, Samaritans it all stems back to this breaking in half of the kingdom and these two shared entities fighting back and forth 
bickering, squabbling. Sometimes they would align for a certain period of time, but most of the time they warred. And why? Over religion. Because Jerusalem had the temple, which had to be the home of God. But Israel needed a temple of its own. So not only did it build one, it built two. One in Bethel, no, back. One in Bethel and one in Dan, two ends of the kingdom. So now we don't just have two countries, we have three temples. And what was the greatest apostasy to the Jewish people? False worship of God. If God is known to live in the temple of Jerusalem, how can there be another temple in Bethel and Dan? the course of time Israel fell they tried hard not to they tried to convince Judah to enter into alliance with them and Egypt and stand up against the Assyrians but they fell Judea fell another 150 years later now The Roman Empire, three districts, the Roman Empire, Galilee, where Jesus is from, Samaria, and Judea. Galilee, they were Jews. They recognized the temple. They traveled down to Jerusalem. And Samaria... They still had two temples to go to. One up above Galilee and Dan, the other in Bethel. And so this angst between these two people continued. Two people who are exactly the same Yet over one issue, they are violently opposed. Here in Ohio, there's lots of preachers who will turn around and point to two certain schools that cannot even name each other to try and show the same level of angst between these two people. That's nice, and it's tongue-in-cheek. But I think we have a better representation today, don't we? We are one, America. We are one, United States. Regardless of the rhetoric, we know the reds and the blues both have the nation's best interest at heart. But the rhetoric, the toxicity of the election, the candidate that you choose to support, the reds and the blues divided our nation in three sections. The blues live out on the edges on the west coast and the east coast. The reds all live in the middle. And we have come to say the cruelest, vilest things. The level to which we despise each other on social media. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. When Jesus 
points to the Samaritan. The good Samaritan. The Samaritan who comes back. The Samaritan that comes back and thanks him. His audience is hearing about that other side of the color spectrum being good, being elevated by your Lord and Savior, being recognized, and your side being shown to be foolish and careless and fail to show grace. That is what we miss in this story. We've heard it so many times. It's expected the Samaritan is good. We've named hospitals after him. We've named a good positive law for him. We know the story so well, we don't understand how terribly despised he is. That the lawyer in hearing the story can't even say the word. But that's not really the unexpected part of this story. The rule about leprosy in the culture was if you felt that you had been healed, you must go and present yourself to the priest. The priest at the temple, not some synagogue, not one of those false temples. You had to go to the priest at the temple, present yourself, be washed, and to be declared by the priest clean. Then you would be well. This despised Samaritan is told your faith has made you well. By Jesus, he is elevated to the office of priest. And he has the ability through his faith to declare himself clean. Unexpected. Unbelievable. If you had the faith of a mustard seed you could go and do the same. Amen.